But what would have happened was he would have, he, his family we know came from the Netherlands. And Payne is not exactly a Dutch name. And the Spanish, as you know, owned the Spanish Netherlands. So he would have, the, the O'Neills flocked to Spain and mostly to the Netherlands, to the Spanish Netherlands. So there would have been a very likely heard that he, he or his ancestors would have uh, gone, like so many others, to the Netherlands and then come across to uh, East Anglia. Because what he was doing before he got into trouble and came over here was he was a customs officer. He was, he was riding up and down the, the marshes of East Anglia. And he's getting his cut. Huh? Getting his cut. No, actually, he he was not. He was he was not actually. He learned how the corruption. He knew there's a fantastic history about him. Um, he learned just how corrupt the aristocracy was, and uh, he was essentially their tax collector, and he didn't like it. But he was also a a great brain. He was actually a member of the royal um, the royal uh, society. That's how he met Franklin. He was a member of the Royal Society. He had designed the br uh, he had designed a bridge. Boy, I told you how we get off onto stuff. He had designed the metal a metal suspension bridge, steel bridge, and basically on a very simple idea that uh, a circle, uh, like the spokes of a wheel, is the most stable thing there is. Well, therefore, if you take part of it, as long as each everything goes in to an imaginary center, uh, then it's stable. This is not called Brookdale, it's a cast iron bridge? A called Brookdale? Well, no. I, the, the, there's a bridge that, that he uh, still stands, I don't know where it is, but he designed it. He And what he did was, completely against all the rules of the day, he put it into the public domain. And he, put, and he brought it over here and he, he, he gave it to the American people as a present. So that you can, because there were so many places that needed those bridges. So they, that that is was his design. He could have been a he could have been now Franklin Benjamin Franklin. Pardon. A railroad bridge. Everything. Every time that's used. That's every time that that concept is used, <coughs> it goes back to Thomas Paine, and uh, he was a member of the Royal Society in London. And of course, when Benjamin Franklin went over, he went straight there, because that's where his peers were, and they talked and so on, and this kind of kind of nobody really from East Anglia but a brilliant guy um, and uh, <clears throat> he was always getting in trouble with the authorities because he was you know, a rebel <laughs> he was Thomas Paine and um, he asked for an introduction uh, some kind of a letter of introduction to America and um, he's, he's fine Jim he's fine just, who? well that's Dan Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 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 Right. That's that. And he uh, he asked um, Franklin for a letter of reference, and he said sure. And he wrote him out a letter introducing him to his son-in-law, who owned a printing press in Philadelphia. And he came over and went straight to work for uh, Benjamin Franklin's uh, son-in-law. And of course. The rest is history. You know, he started writing the pamphlets right away and he wrote uh, Common Sense literally within a year of arriving. So anyway, um, that's interesting that you've mentioned that. But, but anyway, Cork, um, uh, because of its location there, was obviously um, a very important um, outlet for, for Ireland for, uh, for millennia. Um, now during, we'll, we'll kind of labor through that long period between when it became, there's basically two periods, the, the, the early Christian period, uh, and then, well, we didn't even talk about the, the Vikings and the Norsemen, but uh, it became a, a Viking and a Norse town. Um, although it never really thrived because it was always getting overrun by the native Irish. So uh, the, 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 um, the, the men, as, as they call them, submitted to and were paying tribute to the McCarthy's and they, they, they carried on their trade and they did what they did because they were good at it, they had ships and they had stuff that the Irish traders inside didn't, but they had, but the McCarthy's and the bars and all the rest, they had wool, so they traded with them and so they kind of were the, 
the um, the FedEx, if you like, for the Irish. Uh, they they brought the they they they, they traded for them. It absolutely, has to be there in three months. Yeah, that's right. They had a tracking system then. <coughs> um, so they co they coexisted quite well, um, and when they first came, they d they did the usual thing. They they burned the monasteries and stole whatever precious stuff they could get, but by the time that the hinterland Irish became aware, then the next time they came back, they didn't get away so handy. Um, but uh, the the Christian um, uh, churches there, monasteries and so on, were very powerful and very very rich and very and they were essentially uh, universities and learnings, just like. Um, they were in the Shannon, and just like they were uh, up for the north, and but Cork has always been oriented towards Europe, Waterford towards Wales, towards the, towards Britain. So Cork uh, tends to be more <coughs> outward looking, more um, international. But <coughs> um, uh, so yeah, the uh, the Osman. Not, nothing terribly exciting about that period. There's a great deal of um, archaeological digs and remains of, about it, and a great deal of interest in coins and the shapes of boats and all of that stuff. And it's apparently a very um, important to the the uh, Danes and the, Nor the, the Norwegian people because there's a lot of things down there that the Irish are, are less interested in. Um, but the we think of the Vikings and the Norse as um, plunderers. They actually weren't really. They were traders. F far more, they were traders more than they were. And really, the Normans are their descendants. They they just happened to be the Norse that went into the River Seine and thrived in there in in the area centered around Rouen. And they did extremely well. Uh, and um, uh, the French can, king said, "If you stay outside th this line here, you can have all of that, and we'll even make you a duke." So they made him the Duke of Normandy, and they called the whole area Normandy. So the, Normandy um, is a wonderful place, and they developed. Uh, they became very Christian, of course, and they became. They developed um, a wonderful um, culture and uh, economy there, and built some of the finest. Um, the finest cathedrals in in the world. In fact, in many respects, Normandy is the the Renaissance. Uh, so, so they when they came to to Ireland, they brought a great deal of very wonderful things with them, and um, uh, Cork certainly um, benefited, as did most of the rest of the uh, rest of Ireland. But then, so the Norman period um, was a great period. That was a very fine period, and and that. Uh, really started to fall apart um, in the Desmond War when when the when the Earl of Desmond sided with um, or not sided with but decided that he was not going to go along with the the the, the Tudor uh, state, whereas the Ormonds did, and you know there's been a lot spoken and written about if Ireland if the Irish chieftains who were now intermarried in Norman earls, if they had been more, um, if they were on the winning side, <laughs> uh, they, they, they basically took the Yorkist side and lost. And they, if, they, if they had been, but they were on the Lancaster side pretty well all the way down. Um, and in many ways, a lot of Ireland's problems was because they were on the wrong side of the, the, the War of the Roses. Um, and uh, if they had been loyal, but the likelihood is that it wouldn't have made any difference because uh, even the, the reason why Desmond and even the O'Neills and so on, no matter how much they were even wealthier and better off than the English, their English equivalents, they were still treated as second class citizens. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the uh, Fitzgeralds of, of Kildare were without any doubt whatsoever the richest aristocratic house in the entire islands, richer than the than the House of York, the House of Lancaster, than the House of Westminster, any of them. They had 
greater incomes, greater lands, better everything, and yet they were still paddies, you know, when they went across it. And that's what resented them. So it was, it was the English um, racism that caused it, rather than uh, some ordinariness on the part of the Irish, because they were dominated by the old, the same caste, the same Norman blood, the same Norman people that came in and, and dominated Britain. But it was just that for some reason, they just thought that, and most of them who had never been there, when Ch Cromwell came over, he thought, in his famous words, he says, this country is worth fighting for. You know, he was, he agreed. It is as good as Lincolnshire or Lancashire or wherever. So, are you running out of tape? No, no, no. When did they start making the distinction between the old English, I mean, the old English and the new English? Uh, the Tudor times. The old English. The racism story? Well, uh, well, I think there was race, there was, the racism was there always, and that was the problem, I think. <coughs> um, I, I, I just think that. Also, you got to remember that the Norman invasion, the Normans, 